there's an irony that a meeting devoted to challenging the existing paradigm of bioethics would begin with principles. It is, after all, the book called Principles of Biomedical Ethics that still hold, holds a dominant position uh, in the field. Its influence can hardly be exaggerated. Since initial publication in 1979, it has gone through six editions. With it, author, authors Beecham and Childress have shaped two or three generations of bioethicists in the United States and in the world over. The success of the book is due in no small measure to its four famous principles. We could probably rehearse them easily, but I will. Autonomy, non-maleficence, beneficence, and justice. So in talking values and principles here, are we taking a page out of the very paradigm of bioethics that we purport to criticize? The Beecham Childress approach, as it has come to be called, has attracted some strong criticisms. Some, no doubt, from the members of the audience here. First, why these four principles? Was it um, Beecham and Childress on the mountaintop with Moses who were able to divine uh, divine will of, of what the fundamental ethical values are for bioethics? Second, principles come into conflict. So the deductive methods and aspirations of the Beecham Childress approach are suspect and also ineffective, um, especially in particular cases. Finally, as norms become authoritative, they can also become too rigid. It's my belief that all these criticisms, criticisms of principalism ring true, but they can't deter us from taking on the project of examining a core set of values for these meetings. But we, we must start by claiming less than the principalists do, so that we, ironically, might be on firmer ground. A list of values won't determine right answers. We should argue about them and we should think of them strategically. What might the project of articulating values promise for us? I'd suggest first it's about getting the forest for the trees in order to develop an understanding of the higher level concerns that cut across the individual ARTs, biobanks, bidills, shakrabardis that we all work on and care about. Hopefully we can use more general values, values and principles to connect across topics and cases making new holes. Second, values and principles are mobile. They can be communicated, understood, and deployed to develop coalitions. Third, values like social justice, equality, human rights, ecological integrity, and the common good, the Terrytown values articulated last year, are in a constant state of evolution. With or without us, their, meaning, their meanings evolve along with technological ch change. So we jump in or we're left on the curb, in other words. These, thing, these values are being filled up, um, so we might as well get in the conversation. The five values just mentioned are good candidates for our discussion. But in my remaining time, I'd like to briefly introduce a sixth, and that is democratic governance of the life sciences. This one is particularly difficult. Achieving better democratic governance of the life sciences will involve reinventing democracy. But let me start with what democratic governance should not require. It doesn't require that every biology experiment and every question be approved by Congress or a town hall meeting. This is sometimes what is equated with democratic governance of science. There are many forms of activity and institutions that make up the fabric of a vibrant democracy, and so we shouldn't be limited to one vision. So what does the democratic governance of biotechnology mean? I hope that that will be a topic here at Terrytown. For now, let me focus on the following two aspects. One, making science and technology a core concern of deliberative democracy, and two, enlarging participation in science and technology decision-making. We can probably all agree that political space, that the political space available to engage science and technology is narrow at best. 
and the reasons are readily apparent. Technical content, it's very difficult to get into technical content. There's an entrenched science elite. There's the overblown hype of innovation as the solution of all ills. And we have an extreme polarization in uh, a political life, at least in America. These are all major barriers to a strong democratic engagement with uh, biotechnology. But we also probably agree that enhancing societal, the societal capacity to think and act well regarding science and technology is critically important. For one thing, science and technology function as architecture in modern life. And like a constitution, they have the power to organize rights, authority, identity, and culture. With a kind of hard to discern permanence, science becomes nature and technology becomes built in. Even as this is happening, our political forms seem to grow more limited. Citizenship in the biopolitical realm is often reduced to the power of the credit card. Should I purchase a spit kit or not? There seems to be few opportunities for thought or collective action. This is why we may have to rethink democracy in order to create a richer biopolitics. You're probably here because you think a richer biopolitics is possible. That it is possible to develop democratic governance, develop richer forms of societal del deliberation and representation in decision making about the life sciences. We are doing it. We are doing it. We do it, and we must continue to do it. Um, I, I would argue now through at least three modes. I'll call these critique, contestation, and construction. We are each involved in one or more of these activities, and they are mutually reinforcing. So let me close by reviewing these three tools that help us make democratic governance real. Critique is the systematic analysis of prevailing discourse and arenas of action. It is a common concern across academic and civic actors alike, and it can also be a powerful form of networking. Its deployment is itself a normative act. With critique, we open up closed spaces for political assessment and action and denaturalize the world constructed by science and technology. Contestation. Disputing, litigating, or other direct challenges to the mainstream within diverse democratic fora, including courts, hearings, debates, and op-ed pages. Think about the recent BRCA case, the range of plaintiffs and amicus briefs it brought together. But this isn't just about winning particular battles. It's about achieving new kinds of standing within powerful institutions, and therefore about expanding participation. So it's not just about the substantive value at hand, it's about expanding the kinds of potential for a meaningful democratic participation. Third, construction. And here's where we move most definitively towards building a positive vision, to not being satisfied merely with critique. We're also engaged in reforming democratic institutions and bringing new ones into being. Here we move beyond a reactive mode to envisioning the one we wish to inhabit, and finally constructing it, whether it's through legislation, organization, education, or other means. Our values should guide us and challenge us. What does democratic governance as an ideal challenge us to do? I think that further developing mechanisms of deliberation and participation, as advanced through critique contestation and construction moves us in a good direction. If we do this, we have a great opportunity to invent the democratic governance of science, even democracy itself. Thank you.